West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com But we begin the readout with the Republicans' commitment to covering up January 6th. After Senate Republicans thwarted an effort to, for a transparent, bipartisan investigation into the insurrection, House Republicans are already signaling their opposition en masse to House Democrats' efforts for transparency about the deadly siege. Even ones who voted to impeach the former president for his role in citing the mob that day. Tomorrow, the House will vote on a bill establishing a select committee to investigate the siege introduced by Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Under the proposal, the committee will have 13 members, eight appointed by Pelosi herself and five appointed after consultation with Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy. Pelosi will select the committee chair who will have subpoena power. The speaker is also said to be seriously considering using one of her eight unilateral choices to pick a Republican although she hasn't given any indication who that might be. Two Republicans who've spoken out vociferously against the big lie and called for investigations, Adam Kinzinger and Liz Cheney, have not said that they wouldn't serve if asked, but it is up to the speaker, they say. Cheney, who was infamously booted from her Republican leadership position for speaking truth to the big lie, has already made it clear who she thinks has to answer for the events of that day. Should Kevin McCarthy be willing to speak, testify before that commission? After all, he is one of the few people that we know of that was actually talking to Donald Trump while the attack was taking place. He absolutely should, and and I wouldn't be surprised uh, if he were subpoenaed. I think that he very clearly and said publicly that he's got information about uh, the president's uh, state of mind that day. I would hope he doesn't require a subpoena, but I wouldn't be surprised if if he were subpoenaed. Which goes a long way toward explaining why Republicans have no appetite for an accounting of the horrors of January 6th. Political reports that privately lawmakers predict that Kevin McCarthy will gravitate toward controllable Trump acolytes who can work to snarl the select committee's progress. Not surprisingly, a rogues gallery of our absolute worst alumni are already raising their hands to try to derail the committee by joining it, likely by trying to overwhelm it with QAnon, QAnon argle bargle. Lauren Boebert is reportedly gunning for a spot. An accused teen trafficker, Matt Gates, who of course denies that he had sex with a child and trafficked her. And QAnon queen Margie Green have flat out said they want to serve on the committee. Arizona Republican Andy Biggs told Politico, I can't think of anybody better than somebody like a Marjorie Taylor Greene. She doesn't have a committee. She could put a, a lot of time and effort into it. Interesting take on idleness as a qualification, especially since Biggs opposes the committee and says that he plans to vote against it. He also happens to be one of the three House Republicans name checked by Ali Alexander, the organizer of the rally preceding the siege, as helping to plan it. For his part, Kevin hasn't even indicated if he will opt to select any Republicans to serve on the select committee. And his number two, Steve Scalise, is actively encouraging Republicans to vote no 
on the committee legislation. And joining me now, Congressman Raja Krishnamurthy of Illinois, Ellie Mastal, Justice Department co uh, correspondent for the nation, and Susan Del Percio, Republican strategist and MSNBC political analyst. And um, Congressman uh, Krishnamurthy, I want to start with you. Uh, Speaker Pelosi has made it clear that she would reject McCarthy's picks to serve on the January 6th committee, um, that she could reject them. And this is how she answered when asked if she would vote no on some of the Kevin McCarthy's picks. She said, yes, she would not say if she would allow Republicans who voted to overturn Biden's wins to serve. She says, we'll see who they nominate. Is it your expectation that Kevin McCarthy will try to nominate somebody like a Marjorie Taylor Greene or a Matt Gates to try to undercut the committee? Is that your expectation? Um, anything is possible, and I, I wouldn't put it past him to do that. Um, and if he does that, obviously, uh, those folks would, uh, you know, basically, you know, take their cue from Donald Trump. And Donald Trump's voice would then get channeled into this committee, and that would be deeply disturbing. I think that we need people who want to know the truth. They want to know exactly why what happened on January 6th happened, what was the lead up to it. And then, of course, why so few people have actually been brought to justice following January 6th. Those are the types of people we need. And I, and I know you have to vote, so I want, to, I want to ask you a couple more questions before I bring in our other panelists. Do you think, as do a lot of folks, a lot of the, the, the Twitter world and a lot of folks, and I agree with them, say that Liz Cheney should be on this committee? It's, she's somebody who you can't imagine Kevin McCarthy nominating and adding to the committee, but she's obviously got... Uh, strong feelings about the big lie. She she wants there to be transparency. Would you like to see someone like her or Adam Kinzinger nominated by Speaker Pelosi? Maybe even both of them. <laughs> um, I, I, I'd like to see people like that on the committee. I don't know who Speaker Pelosi will choose. I, I think she's going to choose very wisely, as she always does. But the main point of um, uh, having someone like an Adam Kinzinger or Liz Cheney is that they want to know the truth. One very interesting statistic is that 60 to 70 percent of America uh, of Republicans uh, believe that the election was stolen, that Antifa was behind January 6, and Donald Trump had nothing to do with it. Of course, uh, 60 to 70 percent of Americans as a whole believe just the opposite. And so we need people who can kind of uh, start with these foundational facts. And, and then build from there and try to work toward preventing Jan a January 6th from happening again. Is, something, is that something you'd be interested in doing, is being on this committee yourself? I don't know, Joy. I, I think that Speaker Pelosi is going to make some excellent picks, and uh, she always does. And if you were on the committee, let's just project forward, let's just say we, we magically put you on the committee. Do you believe <laughs> that this committee should be prepared to subpoena Kevin McCarthy and ask him what he knows? about what Donald Trump was thinking and doing on January 6th. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, Kevin McCarthy made it very clear to his colleagues, and he has not denied that when he spoke to Donald Trump, uh, you know, Donald Trump basically questioned Kevin McCarthy's loyalty uh, in terms of uh, why he didn't believe as strongly as the rioters and the insurrectionists in the big lie. And so that tells you his mindset and perhaps helps to explain why uh, the D.C. National Guard did not arrive on the scene for five hours um, after the urgent pleas had originally been made by the Capitol Police as well as the D.C. Police for assistance. So this is absolutely crucial, Kevin McCarthy testifying. Uh, Congressman uh, Raja Krishnamurthy, Krishnamurthy, thank you for being here. I know you have to vote, so I'm going to let you go. Thank you very much. Uh, and Ellie let, me, Ellie, let me turn to you, because I think that is a key question. Whether or not we're going to wind up in a series of court cases involving Kevin McCarthy fighting a subpoena, we, you know, this way it's good to have a lawyer friend. Um, walk us through how that might look. I, it's going to look just like it looked with Don McGahn, right? Where McCarthy's going to say no, nobody's going to arrest him, nobody's going to hold him in contempt, nobody's going to do anything. And then two years later, maybe the Supreme Court will rule, ah, you know what? It's actually moot. It doesn't matter if he wants to testify or not. Like, no, nothing's going to happen. And, and Joy, just to be really clear, I want to set the edge here. I do not think any Republicans should be allowed on this committee. They did not vote for this committee. They are not, they, they, some of them are co conspirators Why should a co-conspirator like Kevin McCarthy get to choose which of his boys get to be on the committee? If they want on what the committee, they can give something up. Votes, they can bake, I don't know, they can do something to help justice go forward. And if they're not willing to go for it, they get nothing. That should be, that should be the starting line. They get nothing unless they do something to help.
Does that include uh, Liz Cheney? Because Liz Cheney is definitely not on the same page. Uh, and Adam Kinzinger, would that include them? I don't necessarily see the need to have people, Republicans, who spent four years kind of helping Trump lie to the country and who at the very last minute said like, oh, you know what? All of this lying kind of led to insurrection. That was that. I don't necessarily think that they have a right to be on the committee. I'd be willing to, if you want to throw Liz Cheney on as, as a way to be nice, since she's willing to actually go on TV and say the, and tell the truth, I'd be willing to entertain that. But again, the starting position should be nothing. And then Republicans have to earn their way on through good deeds, which perhaps we can agree Liz Cheney has earned. Let, let, let's go to you, Susan, and bring you in on that. I want to get your comments on that and your response to it, because, you know, the, there, it is a fair point to say that Liz Cheney voted with Donald Trump like 90 percent of the time. I mean, she broke with him on this one thing. But do you think that it would help to, I don't know, make the committee appear to be more legitimate? Do you think there's a reason to put somebody like a Liz Cheney um, or, or an Adam Kinzinger on the commission? Do you, would you recommend um, that Speaker Pelosi do that? Well, I think that the speaker would have to only for PR purposes. I mean, I don't disagree with Eli's thinking on this, but to have a committee with no Republicans is just like they might as well just do it, you know, while they're having lunch. It doesn't make sense to have that kind of hearing. There are 35 people who voted to have a bipartisan commission. They should all be on the table. I know we like to turn to Liz Cheney and Adam Kingser and they offer something up, but even people who McCarthy could put up, he should put up one, some of those 35 that believe in the process. But that being said, Joy, I am for the, I was for a bipartisan commission. I believe in investigating fully. I believe wrong was done and we should find out what it is. That being said, let's not forget this is going to be ended up the Republicans are going to use this as a tool. Let's face it. They know this ends badly, any investigation. So they had a choice. They could say we could participate and then they're part of the, the findings, which isn't good for them either. Or they could say it's all political. And that's what they chose to do because they know the findings are going to be bad and they're already tainting it from the beginning. This is political hardball. And the Democrats are on the right side on this, but as they say in politics, once you're explaining, you're losing. So this is gonna be an argument that look for the Republicans to really galvanize on, because it will be effective, not just within their base, but within some moderates. And that's the political side, not necessarily the right side. It is Wednesday, the 30th of June of 2021. And you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef. And our daily special is Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. And you know what we do with that velvety hollandaise sauce. Well, a uh, little personal note. I was, of course, as you know, feeling under the weather yesterday. I have come to the decision that I... I I was suffering from the heat, uh, days of it, by the way, and I might have gotten a bit of sun poisoning. Uh, the symptoms of sun poisoning, uh, some of those I had, and uh, it seems to have activated the bacterial infection that I had uh, oh so many years ago. <laughs> Who knew? But it looks like the cellulitis had... I don't know, come alive a little bit. And I thought they had been killed with the nuke option. Yeah, I was put into uh, ICU from this bacterial infection. I just thought I'd sprained my wrist. I'd cut my elbow, uh, stupidly trying to move a very large piece of furniture by myself, because that's usually how it works. Try to find help when you need it, and you can't. And I've always been able to carry these types of things by myself, and I had stepped wrong down i just had to carry it two steps down through my garden and into the main house and i uh sort of fell i was able to keep the very large piece of furniture from falling on the ground because i let it fall on me instead because i didn't want to mar it up or the garden but i had scraped my elbow a bit and i thought i had uh irrigated out the wound it wasn't a large wound just a scratch 
And uh, later on that day, my wrist started getting achy and sore and started swelling a bit. And I was convinced it was a sprain. I sprained my arm. I sprained my wrist somehow. Well, I put it off and then I decided, oh, uh, I went and talked to a couple of people and said, you should, you know, go to the doctors. Well, you know, my doctor, the hospital that I was, uh, my plan was part of, uh, was just a couple of blocks away, not even a couple of blocks away. So I walked up there and this is in Berkeley, by the way. So I walked up there and I waited around and I, as it turns out, I know now after the fact that there was a shift change and who I thought was a, uh, you know, a medical person telling me what to do was actually just really just a security person. <laughs> and uh, they sent me somewhere else and those people sent, sent me somewhere else. And I ended up with people telling me, well, we don't take care of that. So I went home and it started swelling even more. And I thought, geez, this is kind of weird. So I sent a picture of it to a picture of it, my, my hand and wrist, my right hand and wrist and forearm. And I sent a picture of it from my phone to my, uh, nurse sister. And she said, you have cellulitis, get to the doctors right now. And I said, what? She said, get to the doctor right now. So I went back to ER at Alta Bates and, uh, uh, waited in line and saw the person who was, you know, giving you the number and told them what I thought was going on. They looked at it. They got up and went to uh, not a back room, but through a door and brought and a nurse came out and they said, sit over here. And that was by the door that she came out and they brought a gurney and put me on the gurney and took me into ICU. Isn't that funny? <laughs> well, they put me into a room and then a doctor looked at me and then they put me in ICU. And I was in the ICU unit. I know that's redundant because ICU is a unit. Uh, uh, for the better part of a week. Little did I know how dangerous it was. Yeah, I could have had my arm lopped off at the at the best. <laughs> so uh, they put me on what was known as the nuke option. And that was Cipro right off the top. Usually they work up to it. But it had become so severe that they had really no choice. And throughout the through, throughout the duration of it, I still didn't realize, you know, how how dangerous that was. So, yeah, irrigate your wounds. And if you have a weird swelling and streaks or anything like that, well, streaks could be blood poisoning, too. But uh, regardless, uh, don't hesitate. Get to the doctor. So. From the heat here recently, my my wrist started swelling up. Now, I have had problems with the thing ever since then because the nerves in that wrist uh, apparently were damaged by the bacterial infection, the cure or whatever. I don't know. But ever since then, I've been having some issues with it that I had never had before. And if I overwork it, it will be an issue it, it, you know it'll wear out and it will ache like the dickens and it started aching like the dickens because i had uh, used a blower an electric blower and it has a certain uh centrifugal force to it and it can get out of hand sometimes so uh i probably that and other things working in the garden and slamming shovels into hard ground ow and not using your feet because it's hard for me to use my my legs because of my knee surgeries on both knees. What the hell did I do? So, um, the wrist felt hot, and if you feel heat, that can be an infection. So I put ice on it and kept it above my heart, situated myself so that I could sleep with my arm up. And uh, did that most of the day. I was pretty darn sick, too. I think when I say sun poisoning, I had other issues like queasiness, a little bit of nausea. Uh, you definitely want to keep uh, fluids through you and whatnot. But I was fairly listless yesterday. I got through the show because the show must go on after all. And um, uh, 
muddle through just, you know, I have to take care of my elderly mom as well because, you know, she needs some help. So I was able to do what I could do there, and that was enough, of course. She's not so infirm. But, um, and the dogs have to be taken care of. I was a little bit late on taking care of the garden, but I just could not do it. Slept most of the day, and I think that I've recuperated quite a bit. Uh, The aches and swelling have gone down tremendously. I don't have, well, I have a little bit of swelling still, but it's going down. Keep ice on, on those things, okay? Ice. Ice is the uh, is the key and the cure. Too bad we're running out of it, huh? So I wonder if the reactivation of my cellulitis is because of climate change. It might be since we here in the Pacific Northwest are having temperatures that no one's ever heard of before. Yeah, we're being baked alive. Okay. Oh, one other little bit of tidbit, a uh, tidbit of news is that the Salem police, the Marion County sheriffs are going through Salem and destroying water stations and cooling stations because they could be used by the homeless. And they have a zero tolerance policy on homelessness. So, of course, they have a lot of homeless. You know, if you make a zero tolerance on uh, policy on homelessness, you, you might as well just have a, uh, you know, come live here because that's what will happen. And I suppose people could be taken care of rather than, well, being punished for what is happening to them. So the police in Salem, Oregon, were destroying water bottles, water stations, cooling stations because the homeless might need them while the earth is being baked alive. 114, 117 degrees in Salem when the police were out there doing that. I don't know. If they were smart cops, they would have confiscated all the stuff and then sold it on the black market like they do guns. Yeah, I'm not kidding either. Anyway, that's what's going on around here. And uh, I'm back on the mend. And I thank you all for putting up with my, uh, well, it was quite a muddled attempt to get through the show yesterday. But we have some uh, interesting news again today to go through and comment on. So why don't we just get into what? we have curated for you today. Of course, at the top, that was Joy Ann Reed breaking it down about why the January 6th committee should subpoena Kevin McCarthy. I don't know how that works, but because he is a member of Congress, but he is also part of the insurgency now, isn't he? Yes, he is. On the rest of the menu, voting machines compromised by the Arizona audit could cost the state millions of dollars to replace. They're already uh, on the hook for six and a half million. They pay it monthly, actually. They lease the machines from Dominion, and they were st- and Dominion was still old, owed three point three mil. So uh, they're going to have to get some new machines, and of course, you know, the costs always go up. So it could be the next contract is more like $10 million. We'll see how that works. Over half of QAnon followers believe Jews are plotting to take over the world. Oh, the protocols of the elders of Zion. Hey, maybe it's climate change that's brought that back to life. Maybe. And Fox News was fined $1 million for sexual harassment and job retaliation. And apparently that's the largest fine they've ever had. I don't think it's enough. After the break, we move to the chef's table, where the Dutch defense minister said irresponsible Russian jets harassed one of its frigates in the Black Sea. And Amnesty International reports that the Hong Kong security law is a human rights emergency. All that and more. On West Coast, cookbook and speakeasy. Bon appétit.
bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com. To the right of the page is the chat room link, and the chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln, and we thank Kelly for doing so. To the left of that chat room link that's near the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com is the link to our Patreon site, and we have that there because though we're able to pay our bills with what comes out of our wallets, we would be unable to pay those bills without your help. So if you could become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio, and if you could afford an espresso-type coffee drink, for instance, and send those funds our way once a month, we then pull money out of our own wallets and what you're able to uh, generously give us to pay our bills, fly under the radar, and continue this resistance against the Nazi takeover of America. I mean, did you see the Texas, there, there's some sort of Texas state agency that's putting out uh, a, a list of terms to look out for when you're trying to take over your, uh, your school board and make sure that they don't teach about anything that could be considered, well, history. <laughs> so we are resisting the book burners. You know they're going to they're they're going to start burning all the rest of the Beatle catalog pretty soon. You know it because that's what they do. They're book burning Nazis and we will not allow it to occur and we thank you for your generosity in allowing us to resist that because it is fulfilling our civic duty as the founders originally intended oh so many years ago. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, do so at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that, and we thank Tom for doing that. Follow me on Twitter, and you might as well. And you can find me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. And why might as you well follow me is because I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's, yes, Daily Co's, about 10 minutes before showtime. If it's a diary, it's on Daily Co's. I know they're trying to make them stories, but they'll always be a diary. And the show notes and links are in that diary. And that's where the real reportage is. So follow me at Justice Putnam. Now, you can also follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West. And most importantly, do please pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, YouTube, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, wherever, wherever, geezer. Or is it Deezer? Deezer. <laughs> maybe maybe they should have a podcast platform called Geezer. Yeah, that's what we are. Who knew that we be, we would become old geezers anyway? Lucky for us. You know, lucky for us. Enough of that. Let's get into the curated show because that's how we center ourselves when there's so much chaos in the world. Emily Singer of the American Independent brings this first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. The Maricopa Board of Supervisors announced that it will not reuse hundreds of vote counting machines it fears were tainted by the shoddy Republican forced audit of the county's 2020 election results, the Arizona Republic reported. According to reports, the cost of the machines that won't be recertified was six million bucks. This comes as the latest scandal in the already scandal-plagued audit that opponents say has not followed proper procedures or even election law. And that experts say is being done solely to back up Donald Trump's lies that the 2020 election was stolen from him through fraud. Arizona Secretary of State Katie Hobbs told the Republican-majority Maricopa County Board of Supervisors in May that she feared the audit, which was not following proper protocols and was being run by a company owned by a Trump-supporting conspiracy theorist, had compromised the machines and made them unusable in the future. And on Monday, the board sent a letter to Hobbs saying that it agreed with her and that the machines will not be used in future elections. The county leased the machines from Dominion Voting Systems for 6.1 mil and was halfway through the lease, still owing 3.3 as of May under its contract, which it was paying on a monthly basis. Leasing new machines could cost millions, and it's unclear who will foot the bill. 
Hobbs said that the Arizona Senate had subpoenaed the machines and turned them over to the contractors, thereby breaking the chain of custody that it had agreed in advance would not be the responsibility of the county while it had control of the machines. The Board of Supervisors told the Arizona Republic that it has not decided whether it will ask the Senate to cover the cost of replacing the machines. And the audit has been plagued by scandal since it began. Arizona Senate President Karen Fan hired Cyber Ninjas to run the audit. Cyber Ninjas is run by Doug Logan a Trump supporter who helped push voter fraud lies to aid the failed effort to overturn Trump's loss. And Logan appears in a film called The Deep Rig that premiered over the weekend. It includes lies about the 2020 election that repeat QAnon claims and its producers claim that all profits from the film will go to fund the audit. Observers witnessed auditors not following proper protocol, including using pens that could have been used to alter ballots and leaving ballots unsecured. The Department of Justice has raised concerns that the entire audit may be in violation of federal law. And even some Republicans have called for it to end, including one GOP state senator who initially supported the review It makes us look like idiots, Senator Paul Boyer said in May. It makes you look like? Come on, you are. He continues, Looking back, I didn't think it would be this ridiculous. It's embarrassing to be a state senator at this point. Well, you know, you made your bed, buddy. The Maricopa County Board of Supervisors sent a letter to Fan in May in which they demanded an end to the audit. The board accused the GOP-controlled Senate of acting in bad faith saying it has no intention of learning anything about the November 2020 general election, but is only interested in feeding the various conspiracy theories that fuel fundraising schemes of those pulling your strings. And that was a direct quote quote from the Board of Supervisors, the Republican Majority Board of Supervisors in in Maricopa County. Polling conducted found that the audit is also unpopular with voters in Arizona and a GOP consulting firm in the state warned it could hurt Republicans' chances in the 2022 midterms. That has not deterred Republicans in Arizona, nor has it deterred Republicans in other states who are looking to use the Maricopa audit as a model for examining their own election results. Oh, so I guess they want to compromise all those ballots and all those machines And what nefarious means are they going to use all of that for? I suppose one could then just call it Putinesque. Rod at the American Independent brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. At the dawn of the 20th century, a booklet based on anti-Semitic lies about a shadowy plot by Jews to control the world that was originally published in Russia in 1905 and subsequently translated into other languages began spreading throughout Europe into other countries. A century later, the ideas captured in the Protocols of the Elders of Zion still have their adherence. A morning consult poll conducted on between April 27 and 29 and published on June 28 finds that nearly half of believers of the QAnon conspiracy theory also believe in the purported plot by Jews for world domination. Experts say the overlap is not all that shocking. 
People with conspiratorial worldviews believe conspiracy theories. To them, events and circumstances are often the outcomes of shadowy conspiracies. Joseph Usinski, an associate professor of political science at the University of Miami and the co-author of American Conspiracy Theories, told the American Independent Foundation. So they're not just going to believe one conspiracy theory. They're going to believe a whole bunch. Of Americans who believe in the protocols, almost 80% believe in QAnon too. Wow. QAnon centers on the belief that a group of celebrity Satan-worshipping pedophiles runs the world through a deep state government. Oh, you mean you already have those, except they're not liberals. Let's just put it that way. And they're not Jews. Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter began cracking down on banning QAnon count accounts last year, while the FBI warned lawmakers earlier this month that QAnon conspiracy theorists may mount more acts of violence. Vegas Tenhold, a researcher at the Anti-Defamation League, told the Business Insider last fall that there are several tropes that really sort of smack about anti-Semitism in QAnon. You're going to find very few global conspiracy theories that don't touch on anti-Semitic tropes. And genocide study scholar Gregory Stanton called QAnon a recast version of the protocols, replacing a cabal of nefarious Jews with a new group of shadowy elites. On January 6, QAnon believers and anti-Semites found a common stage to air their fringe beliefs. One of the most striking images to emerge from the riot by supporters of Trump at the U.S. Capitol was that of a man wearing a sweatshirt emblazoned with the words Camp Auschwitz, a reference to the Nazi concentration camp where almost a million Jews were murdered during the Holocaust. Trump gave cover to both groups to emerge from the fringes of mainstream thought and profess their views proudly. Magda Teeter, professor of history at Fordham University and the author of Blood Libel, On the Trail of an Anti-Semitic Myth, told the American Independent Foundation as well. You have a gradual amplification of voices that have been just a few years ago fairly marginalized and deep web and hidden. You really had to dig in if you were interested in the far right and anti-Semitic fringe, uh, Teeter said. This changed since really Trump became the political figure that he became in 2015, starting to run for president, giving voice and weight to some of those people and some of those voices. According to a report published by the Anti-Defamation League in 2020, 2019 was the worst year for anti-Semitic attacks since it started tracking anti-Jewish hate 40 years ago. And many of those attacks are inspired by anti-Semitic ideas peddled by conspiracy theorists on the Internet. In 2018, Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene, one of QAnon's most prominent adherents, claimed that the Jewish Jewish Rothschild family was responsible for starting California's worst wildfire in history with a space laser. Oh, my. Currently, 15% of Americans agree that government, media, and financial systems are controlled by Satan-worshipping pedophiles running a global child sex trafficking ring, according to a May poll conducted by the Public Religion Research Institute and Interfaith Youth Corps. The beliefs and theories that were totally fringe and unacceptable, unacceptable now are espoused by members of Congress, to no really serious consequence, said Fordham's teeter.
David Boder of the Associated Press brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. The New York City Commission on Human Rights has fined Fox News $1 million, the largest penalty in its history for violations of laws protecting against sexual harassment and job retaliation. As part of the settlement agreement announced yesterday, Tuesday, Fox also agreed to mandate anti-harassment training for its New York-based staff and contributors and to temporarily drop a policy requiring people who allege misconduct to enter into binding arbitration. The penalty stems from an investigation that began in 2017 following several reports of what the commission called rampant abuse at the popular news and opinion outlet. The first indication of problems at the channel came in 2016 when former anchor Gretchen Carlson charged that now-deceased network chief Roger Ailes had made unwanted advances and derailed her career when she rejected him. Both Ailes and former Fox personality Bill O'Reilly lost their jobs over misconduct allegations. Several other women have come forward with lawsuits and their own harassment allegations, including former Fox anchor Megyn Kelly. The $1 million fine groups four separate willful and wanton violations that each carried a maximum penalty of two hundred and fifty grand. The commission would not identify the people involved in those cases or whether there are more. Human rights officials said they hoped the large penalty would deter bad behavior at any workplace. If people would dare to break the law and discriminate or harass people, there will be stiff penalties they would have to pay, said Carmeline Malalis, chairwoman of the City Commission on Human Rights. Fox has characterized the cases as the product of a previous regime and said the network has cleaned up its act under the leadership of Susan Scott, current CEO of Fox News Media. The commission said it did not interview anyone who came forward after Scott took over in 2018. Well, that brings us to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today. You're listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Kim Lowe. This week, not that long, but strange. If the movie Gaia had to be summed up in a word, it might be trippy, which is sort of appropriate given the central role of mushrooms in the proceedings. Way more than just trippy, though, Gaia is a cautionary tale about humanity's destructive influence on the world, noting, apocalyptically, that nature always wins. The convention here is that of a horror movie with plenty of thrills and chills throughout. Set in South Africa, the story starts with two forest rangers, Winston and Gabby, who are on assignment in a national park. After the pair become separated, Gabby stumbles upon a pair of resident survivalists, Baron and his son Stefan. Injured by a booby trap set up by the pair to dissuade intruders, Gabby has no option but to stay with them. As she recovers, it becomes clear that there's something else in the forest that's not exactly human or human anymore. The creature, best described as a human-shroom hybrid, seems connected to a mysterious fungus that's found in the forest and which affects everyone, including Gabby. As the layers are peeled back on Baron's former life, we find that he was formerly a chemical engineer, casting a looming doubt as to the natural or other origins of the fungus. Roughly based on the controversial Gaia theory of the 1970s, there's a creepy sexual subtext involving Barron's adolescent son and Gabby, as well as a biblical parallel to the Isaac and Jacob story in the final act. Beautifully shot and sound mixed, and with a strong performance from Carol Nell as Barron, Gaia is scary, thought-provoking, and stylish in a tight 96 minutes, and is even more notable as its director, Jack O'Bower's first full-length feature. This has been Take Two Movie Review. I'm Kim Lowe. Catch up with us at TakeTwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our channel on YouTube.
One in six Americans get sick from eating contaminated food each year. Contamination caused by salmonella is especially common. It's sometimes found in poultry, eggs, ground beef, pork, and even peanut butter. To reduce your risk from this and other foodborne germs, remember to clean, separate, cook, and chill. Clean your hands with soap and water. Separate raw meat, poultry, and seafood from other foods. Wash counters, cutting boards, and utensils before and after using them. Cook all food thoroughly and use a food thermometer to make sure food is cooked. Promptly chill meat, poultry, eggs, and other perishables. Finally, don't prepare food for others if you're sick, and be extra careful when you prepare food for children, pregnant women, the elderly, or people in poor health. To learn more about making food safer to eat, visit www.cdc.gov/vitalsigns. I'm probably okay to have one more drink before I drive home. I'm probably okay. I open the window to stay alert. Probably okay. I just pop some gum in my mouth. Step out of the car, please. I probably made a mistake. Probably okay isn't okay when it comes to drinking and driving. If you see a warning sign, stop and call a cab, a car, or a friend. Buzz driving is drunk driving. A message brought to you by NHTSA and the Ad Council. Hi, I'm Tom Harbin, and since you're listening to NetRootsRadio.com, show your progressive side and go to the donate button on the bottom of the homepage. It's progressives like you who power NetRoots Radio and keep the progressive message beaming everywhere 24 hours a day. Just go to our donate button at the bottom of netrootsradio.com. Thank you for keeping Progressive Radio at full power. Ralph Waldo Emerson told of a dinner guest who went on and on about the virtue of honesty, offering his own life as a model of perfect rectitude. The louder he talked of his honor, said Emerson, the faster we counted our spoons. That's my reaction to the cacophony of phony piety arising from Republican governors and legislators who are trying to enact more than 250 new state laws to stop black, Latino, Asian American, indigenous, and other non-Caucasian voters from casting ballots. Yet they proclaim, we're not racist, we're righteous crusaders protecting the sanctity of the vote. Really? So why are they specifically targeting people of color with their repressive voting restrictions? For example, panicky Republican lawmakers in Georgia tried to outlaw any early voting on Sundays. Odd. Why? It's a flagrantly racist attack on the black church. For years, a joyous civic tradition called Souls to the Poles has played out in southern black churches on Sundays prior to Election Day. After the sermon and prayers, congregants, ministers, musicians, and others in the church family travel in a caravan to early voting locations to cast ballots. It turns voting into a civic, spiritual, and fun experience. What kind of shriveled soul tries to kill that? Apparently, the same shameful souls in the Georgia GOP who want to stop local groups from providing water and snacks to citizens forced to wait for hours in line to vote. They're actually trying to make it a crime to give water to thirsty voters. Hey, Republicans, what would Jesus do? This is Jim Hightower saying the goal and duty of every public official ought to be to maximize voter turnout. After all, the more Americans who vote, the stronger our democracy. But there's the ugly political truth. Republican officials no longer support democracy. The Hightower Radio Lowdown is brought to you by the Lowdown Happy Hour. Now live streaming on Facebook from the Chat and Chew Cafe. So grab a libation, pull up a virtual chair, and join our freewheeling conversations with political mavericks, musical agitators, and kick-ass grassroots groups. The Lowdown Happy Hour will connect you to good trouble activists who are building people power across America. Get the Lowdown at HightowerLowdown.org. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. Uh. 
On this day in labor history, the year was 1928. That was the day the state of Alabama outlawed the convict lease system that had been in practice for decades. Slave masters throughout the South had routinely loaned out enslaved people before slavery was finally abolished. The convict lease system continued this practice as the South worked to rebuild in a rush of rapid industrial growth after the Civil War. African Americans found themselves increasingly subject to sweeps by local and state authorities that coincided with harvest time or when labor agents arrived looking to man the coal mines. Many were convicted on trumped-up charges and shipped off to prison. Once there, they were leased to private industries and dispatched mostly to coal mines near Birmingham. By 1890, the state profited $164,000 a year. By 1912, prison mining brought in over a million dollars in state revenues. In the PBS documentary, Slavery by Another Name, Douglas Blackman and other scholars note that prisoners could be driven in a way that earlier enslaved workers and free labor could not. Convict labor served to depress wages, curtail union activity, organizing, and strikes. These workers could also be worked practically to death and easily replaced. Progressive reformers, socialist party leaders, and United Mine Workers District 20 would wage an unrelenting war against the convict lease system for years. Even the 1911 Banner Mine explosion that killed 123 African-American prisoners couldn't outlaw the practice. Finally, newly elected Governor Bibb Graves yielded to the public outcry that condemned the practice as a relic of barbarism. He also ceded to workers' demands for jobs. Graves subsequently put prisoners to work on chain gangs building roads throughout the state, making Alabama the last state to abolish the convict lease system. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. We always begin, whether from around the world, along the banks of the Rogue River, in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 65 degrees Fahrenheit, expected to be a tad cooler than even yesterday, which we hope so because it got up to 106 here yesterday. Only supposed to be at 97 with sunny skies throughout the day. Winds out of the northwest at 10 to 15 miles per hour. And they've been quite brisk. Or actually stiff, because it's not brisk. It's stiff, hot winds. And the gusts are about 30 to 40 miles. So, uh, yeah, we've been having that. Generally clear skies tonight with lows in the low to mid 60s. Winds out of the northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Mainly sunny tomorrow with highs in the low 90s. Let's hope that's true. Winds out of the northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Confirmed cases of coronavirus in Jackson County in southern part of Oregon. As the restrictions on masks have been lifted, I'm not taking mine off in a public space inside or out, but that's just me. I'm following the World Health Organization's recommendations on that one because of the uh, Delta variant and others. Anyway, uh, 116,026, which is an increase from the over the weekend totals from over the weekend, of course. And uh, our deceased have increased to 147, though that remains the same because it increased over the weekend. Yeah, we're going to take off our masks. Not me, not in this part of the state, at least. Grass pollen is rated as high outside the window here at the mothership in Rogue River. The air quality index is good at 42 parts per million, and the daytime UV index remains very high at 9. Barometric pressure is holding steady at 29.88 inches. Visibility is up to 10 miles, and relative humidity is at 68%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that are crowd. Crowdsources from around the world. London is 61 and cloudy. Paris is 64 with showers in the vicinity. Rome is 85 and sunny. 
Kiev is 85 and fair. Kabul is 82 and partly cloudy. Hong Kong is 81 and mostly cloudy. Tokyo Prefecture, yes, is 70 degrees and cloudy. Sydney, Australia is 56 and partly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 54 and cloudy. And New York, New York is a 90 degrees Fahrenheit hot day and sunny. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that are crowd crowdsources from around the world. Reuters staff brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The Netherlands defense minister said that Russian fighter jets armed with air-to-surface missiles had harassed a Dutch Navy frigate in the Black Sea earlier this month, conducting mock attacks and jamming communication systems. The Russian defense ministry said it had scrambled fighter jets and bombers to prevent the frigate from entering Russian waters. The Russian military said the warplanes flew at a safe distance from the vessel and in line with international regulations. The Netherlands defense ministry said the Russian actions took place over a span of five hours on June 24th and violated rights to free use of the sea. The frigate, Everston, was sailing with Britain's carrier strike group, which which was carrying out a patrol in the area at the time. Defense Minister Ant Bervert Schutten called the Russian action irresponsible. The Everston has every right to sail there, she said. There is no justification for this kind of aggressive act, which needlessly increases the chance of accidents. She indicated the Netherlands would raise the matter with Russia at the diplomatic level. Je te donne, c'est mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, rester toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Even more, Reuters staff brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Amnesty International said that Hong Kong authorities have used a new national security law to target dissent and justify censorship, harassment, arrests, and prosecutions that violate human rights in the year since it was implemented. Beijing imposed a sweeping national security law in June last year that sets out punishment for anything it deems as subversion, secession, colluding with foreign forces and terrorism with up to life in prison, setting the city on a more authoritarian path. Authorities have said the law would affect an extremely small minority of people and that it had restored stability after months of often violent protests in 2019. They have said rights and freedoms in the former British colony remain protected, but they are not absolute. Most high Profile Democratic politicians and activists have been arrested under the new law or for protest related charges or are in self exile. In one year, the national security law has put Hong Kong on a rapid path to becoming a police state and created a human rights emergency for the people living there, said Amnesty International's Asia, Asia Pacific Regional Director Yamani Mishra. Ultimately, this sweeping and repressive legislation threatens to make the city a human rights wasteland, increasingly resembling mainland China. 
Well, 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 that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on. And we're going to meet up tomorrow for Metro Shrimp and Grist Thursdays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we'll meet up here tomorrow, right here, in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TF, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver